Hello, and welcome to the 2014 Nursa Championship Series Regional Play Football Officials Webinar. My name is Arianne Judy, Coordinator for Intramural Sports at Colorado State University, and today I will be joined by Chris Cox, the Assistant Director of Intramural Sports at Clemson University. Together, we will be presenting information on Nursa, the Regional Play Football Tournament for Fall 2014, and what you can expect when officiating at a regional tournament. An overview of the webinar's agenda is as follows. We'll talk about the Nursa Championship Series Regional Tournament Sites for 2014. We'll talk a little bit more about Nursa involvement and have a contact list for you for further information outside of the Nursa Championship Series. We'll talk about general information, what to expect, the interactions and expectations for the tournament, hotel information, attire and equipment, and because some universities have different rule modifications, it is important for us to review NERSA rules. So Chris will be going over major rule changes, timing, overtime, line of scrimmage, screen blocking, play guarding, co-rec rules, and basic four person mechanics. As you can see, all six regions host tournaments throughout the fall culminating with the national championship being held at the University of West Florida January 2nd through the 5th. Each regional selects all tournament officials and gives bids to these officials to officiate at the national tournament where we see the top teams and top officials from across the country. If you are interested in learning more about the opportunities within your assessment, we would encourage you to reach out to your region's representatives. There is a regional rep, professional staff member, as well as a student leader for each of the six regions. What to expect? Teams. Remembering that teams come from all over the region, there will be large and small schools. The level of competition for these tournaments uh, can vary from your experience depending on the tournament site. Fellow officials, get ready to meet new people. This is a great networking opportunity and an opportunity to work with and learn from people across your region and even outside of your region. We encourage you to not be afraid to approach someone and introduce yourself at the tournament. During the Friday's officials meeting, be prepared to bring your officiating gear with you. Don't expect to have time to head back to your hotel before the games begin. It is likely that depending on the size of the tournament, you will be officiating that Friday evening. Remember to dress professionally. Professional appearance uh, is important in representing yourself and your university at this tournament. Typically, a school polo or shirt and nice wax is recommended. At this Friday meeting, you'll also go over a typical agenda for the weekend talk about what the game schedule look like, and also have an abbreviated training as designed by the Tournament Officials Committee and the Director of Officials for the Tournament. Payment, each school is different, but typically $10 of the game or a set spending that will be available to you from the Director of Officials prior to the beginning of the tournament. Interactions and expectations. Interactions with the evaluators, it's important to listen and learn. You will receive a lot of feedback throughout the weekend, and it's important that you listen to that feedback and attempt to put it into practice while out on the field. Sometimes evaluators make mistakes, so if you do disagree with an evaluator's comments, it's important that you ask the questions and discuss this with the director of officials. This is a great learning experience and an opportunity to learn from clinicians from other universities with a variety of experiences. So be sure to take advantage of that while you're there. Interactions with other officials. Again, encouraging you to be a good crew member. A crew chief. A crew chief will be assigned uh, by the director of officials and the official committee uh, for the tournament. A crew chief is usually your head rep. Um, and the person who's going to organize and be responsible for your crew, getting you all together for the meetings, the pre-games, um, and 
essentially kind of your leader um, and who you'll go to throughout the tournament. And being prepared to be put with different crews throughout the tournament and the ability to work with different officials is a really important aspect of officiating in regional tournaments as well. Interaction with participants. Remember to always be professional and answering questions in a professional manner, time permitting. Sportsmanship expectations. Keep an eye out for both good and bad. It's important as a regional tournament. There will be an alternate staff that will also be watching for sportsmanship from each of the teams. And it's important to have that held to a high standard from you and your crew throughout the tournament. Remember, part of our preventative officiating, commend positive sportsmanship, picking up the play belt, helping opponents up, cleaning up the play after the play is dead, and again, stopping the negative action, making sure that we address things like language uh, and any unsporting acts that definitely need to be addressed. For further uh, sportsmanship rules and time expectations, those are all outlined in the Brewster rule book as well. Overall expectations, that you know your schedule before the weekend. Again, professionalism um, and being able to give your best while you're there for, for the tournament. And again, working together to make sure that the tournament is a success. Some more general information. Uh, hotel, remember that you are a representative of your home school in the tournament. So that means that we respect the hotel and its staff and that we respect our roommates as well. Going to bed in a timely manner, making sure that you're polite as far as getting ready in the morning, um, and again, just being a good crewmate and member during the tournament. Attire, uh, you typically receive a list of things from the director of officials or official committee about attire specifics, um, but some of the major things and main things to um, consider bringing, bring a short and long sleeve collared striped Sure. Remember to plan for the weather and even the potential change of weather. So bring that cold weather gear. Bring black shorts and pants. A high school style white stripe may be worn. Again, more specifics can be given by uh, the director of officials, but it's always good to bring both sets of uh, both black shorts and pants. Black cleats and sneakers. Um, again, looking the part, making sure that you have the correct gear. Again, you can reach out to um, the official committee and the director of officials to find out if your tournament is going to be using perhaps turf uh, or a combination of both. Black and white socks, again, so that you're prepared. Um, and again, if you need to change socks throughout the day, depending on the weather, making sure you bring multiple pairs. And then a black fitted hat with white piping. Um, and again, you can find out if this is required for your tournament. Always better to ask questions and come prepared and to forget something back home. Equipment from the field, uh, it's recommended two-weighted penalty flags, that you have a set of orange and yellow cones, that you have your bean bag. Always good idea to bring the stopwatch, that you obviously have your whistle, and a down indicator so that you were prepared for all the games. I will now pass this off to Chris to talk about the rule that Thanks, Maria. Um, and, and before I get started, I just want to say and, and kind of reiterate that our intent here uh, with our presentation today, uh, and especially with the next few slides, really, the rules is not to come out of an intensive rule clinic or anything like that. And as we'll see with the number of slides we have and the amount of time we have, that would be a possible event. Um, we just want to highlight some specific areas that are usually going to be more sensitive at the regional tournament site. Uh, things for you as an official to make sure that you know well before you're going to arrive into the tournament. Some things will kind of help you be ahead of the game, ahead of the game and, and prepared for those things. Um, so starting with rule updates, and these are not new for this year for 2014, um, but they are from 2012-2013, but just kind of as a refresher. Um, and noting that these are certainly not all of those rule updates, but um, some that are kind of more, um, that stand out a little bit more, might be something that you get refresh yourself on. Uh, so, so remembering things like offensive and passive, or offensive and defensive passers here. Um, so walk down, automatic first down is being eliminated now. Uh, kick-catching interference and that's still the enforcement. 
Uh, you can kind of see some different things on this screen, and again, certainly refresh yourself and check out your new rule books and those rule updates. Um, if, if it hasn't, if it's been a little while since you looked. Um, starting off with our, our timing procedure, something that's pretty basic, but can be done differently at different campuses around the, the country and the region. So you want to make sure that you're prepared to operate under the NCS and the NERSA guidelines within the rule book for timing. Um, so that's going to include your 48 minute game, which is divided into four 12 minute quarters, um, switching directions after the first and third period, things like that. And they're, again, fairly basic. Um, just making sure you are aware of how we'll operate at your regional tournament. Um, the back judge position will be the person who keeps the official game clock and communicates that to their partners and the players. Um, looking at timeouts, three one minute timeouts per half. Um, anything that's unused will not carry over from one half to another on regulations of overtime. Um, if overtime is required, each team will have one timeout for the entire duration of the overtime period. Knowing when to start the back, back to clock is always important. Um, and again, it's something you want to really have a second nature for yourself before you attend the regional. Um, so knowing that prior to the final two minutes of each half, the clock is only going to stop for team or official timeout. But once we do get within the, the final two minutes of each half, the clock is going to stop for any completion, safety, timeout, touchback, change of possession, out of bounds, first down, penalty, and touchdown. So a lot of different scenarios that are there to uh, make sure that you as an official can understand and identify when the clock is either going to start on the next track or the ready for play. Again, uh, referencing overtime, um, there are some pretty specific rules um, related to overtime that you may or may not be accustomed to on the campus. Um, knowing that an overtime period consists of a series of four downs. Uh, with the object, of course, being the score touchdown game. Each team will start first and goal from the opponent's 10 yard line. Um, unless moved by penalty or anything like that, but the line of the game will always be the goal line. So that's an important one to remember in overtime. Um, if the first team who is awarded uh, possession of the ball scores, the opponent will then still have the chance to tie or win the game. Um, Try with an overtime are going to be attempted and then scored just like they would in regulation based on Rule 8 within the rule book. Um, if our score does remain tied after one or two periods of overtime, you know, we'll continue to progress through our opinion uh, as needed um, to determine a um, A couple more specifics. Um, one is with um, overtime periods progressing from one to another when they remain tied, uh, remembering that that alternating choice will take place. So more likely than not, it's just going to kind of go in order back and forth. But between overtime periods, teams do have that option, again, uh, of making that choice. And that's something you can discuss with your official committee and the director of official that you turn as well to be sure that you're clear on that. Um, team B secures possession of the ball is dead, and that period is over. That's another one that's kind of specific to overtime. And again, uh, one time off for that overtime period. You will be working um, in a four-person group, so understanding the basic four-person mechanics um, before you arrive at your tournament will be important. Um, you can see listed here some initial positions, the checklist, and primary areas of coverage um, for your referee, line judge, field judge, and back judge positions. Um, so again, the, the idea today is not to even come close to going through everything that you'll need to know with that, um, just kind of reminding you, you know, whether or not you do this on your campus. Um, you will be in the four-person group at your regional level, so make sure you go through the rule book and, and understand what's going to be expected of you there. The line of scrimmage, um, a little bit more specific um, rules related, is certainly an area where there's a lot going on within the game. So being able to know things like the minimum number of players that are needed, player restrictions once they're on the line of scrimmage, things like that are going to be key for you as an official. Uh, there will certainly be contact that occurs really all over the field, but specifically within this area pretty frequently. And being able to know and as well as identify what sort of contact might be minor, might be unintentional, and maybe is enough to remain legal versus something, some sort of contact that is illegal. Um, and again, those scenarios come into play pretty frequently on the line of service. So things like screen blocking can happen quickly. Um, 
but can really be a major part within the game, so it's important to identify and, and know those fundamentals of what we're looking at and what we're going to call um, really initiating contact is a major point here, something that you'll likely hear at your tournament, um, whether or not um, someone initiated or who initiated contact is going to be important in determining whether or not a foul was committed or a penalty was committed and on to. Um, again, um, line of scrimmage as well, your dead ball penalty, um, so all those are going to occur around this area. So knowing these and being confident enough to identify them and get in there and stop that play from occurring, we do have things like a ball star, a legal snap, and constant within flag football is flag guarding. Um, so you're certainly going to see this when working your regional tournament. Um, and in talking about flag guarding, we are really mentioning an illegal attempt to prevent um, an opponent from removing your flag belt. So this could be swinging of the hand over your flag belt, placing the ball um, in your possession, in your possession over the flag belt so your opponent can't reach it. Lowering your shoulder in a manner that prevents, again, your opponent from reaching your flag belt. All sorts of things, really. Um, but we have some examples. Um, you can see some photos on your screen of what flag guarding might look like. Um, important here um, is, again, that kind of advantage versus disadvantage thing. You know, maybe there was some flag guarding, but the flag was pulled anyway. Is that something we want to really call and then identify the flag guarding? Or, you know, we mentioned placing and swinging your hands over the flag belt. That's if a runner is doing that, but a defender is, you know, 30 yards away, are we really gaining an advantage there? So that might be some conversations you have. And again, certainly deferring to our official committee and director of officials of what we're really looking at at that tournament. Um, the flag guarding still being one of those teams that you're quickly going to hear and need to tune up on and identify heading into the tournament. And finally, correct fundamental. Um, can get the, the better of even the best of them. Um, so knowing that there will be correct play most likely at your regional tournament and identifying the key points that we have here with um, certainly your touchdown value is going to be an important one. Any time that a female player scores a touchdown, that point value is going to be nine rather than six. Um, or if a female throws a forward pass um, or a touchdown is scored, um, that point value is going to be nine rather than six. Male runner can not be the first to break through the line of scrimmage. Um, so that is a, a different swing than the women's play versus pro rank play. Um, and then certainly knowing our open and closed play. Um, knowing that on an open play, any player can throw or catch and really do whatever needs to happen. But on that closed play, we cannot have a forward pass from any male pass into a male. Um, so there are a lot of specifics that kind of go along with that. And again, identifying things like what technically goes into opening a closed play, so maybe the legal forward pass that involves a female passer or a receiver and needs to gain positive yards. Um, also remembering that any foul we might have on a play, whether it's accepted or declined, is not going to have an effect on whether the next play is open or closed. So be sure to, to go through these and, and, and familiarize yourself with the right fundamentals and rules before heading um, to your tournament as well. And that wraps up our overview of what you can expect from your regional tournament experience. Thank you for joining us today. We hope that this webinar was informational and useful in helping you prepare for the NERSA Championship Series Regional Play Football Experience. And feel free to reach out to your supervisor and or the tournament staff with further questions as the tournament approaches. Thank you.